Well, thank you so much, Dr. King. Um, I just wanted to add that you will be seeing more of me, uh, not in the presenter capacity for the rest of this lecture series. So um, just be forewarned, um, for better or for worse, take that as you will. Um, so yeah, I will be moderating this uh, lecture series in the future. So thanks so much for your attention to this presentation and we're just gonna get started. So um, I, I, I wanted to introduce this topic of chronic pain and PTSD um, kind of out of a personal sort of experience with both um, having come out of training at the VA, both in Phoenix and in Palo Alto. This is something that I saw very much occurring together a lot. Um, and so I thought it would be helpful to do kind of a, a mini presentation on this um, and talk a little bit more about why we think these two things occur together, um, why uh, they may be impacting each other, um, and a little bit of insight into um, some very general recommendations as to kind of how to approach this from a clinical standpoint. Um, and as a consumer of those clinical services. So um, just to get started, um, I thought that because I was the first in the academic year to do this presentation, um, I wanted to just cover some basic um, information about what chronic pain is. And one of our go-to sources is of course the International Association um, for the Study of Pain. And they define chronic pain to generally be an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. Um, I wanted to really highlight this because I think oftentimes it's easy to describe pain in terms of body parts or in terms of medical conditions, but now we know that there is this huge emotional and I would also argue social experience that goes along with this. Um, and it can be sometimes associated with potential uh, tissue damage. Um, and, and I wanted to also mention this because um, again, I think it's, um, it's, it's very easy to, you know, stay focused um, on sort of like the imaging, you know, to point to specific places, um, but sometimes the imaging may not actually tell us the full story or any part of the story. Um, more, to, more on that to come, but um, I just wanted to mention that, um, that it's sometimes associated with potential tissue damage, but sometimes it's not. And so understandably, we see a lot of folks who come in after having tried many different medical things and still you know, not having found the thing that has worked for them. And I would say that's, that's probably the predominant um, experience of folks that we see, especially at Stanford. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something we wanna be aware of as well. Um, also importantly, I just wanted to mention that chronic pain excuse me, differs from short-term pain in that it exists for longer than three months um, and that it is a huge, huge, just worldwide problem. It affects about 20% of people around the world. So in general, um, this is kind of what I just said. It's chronic pain is that lasting longer than three months. It is a condition that deserves its own uh, attention um, in many different uh, I think professions, and it does definitely get that, I think increasingly. Um, and it may or may not be associated with a known cause, or it may not necessarily be associated with some sort of tissue damage. And that sometimes it exists beyond, you know, having treated these things with multiple um, approaches. So I'm very lucky in the fact that here at Stanford, um, I think everyone, not just the psychologists, but everyone on board, the physicians, the nursing staff, the physical therapy staff, et cetera, we all kind of have this shared understanding that chronic pain is not just this biological experience or a biological um, condition, right? That we also have to take into consideration social factors. So oftentimes, you know, patients come in saying, you know, my pain has prevented me from having, you know, a, a, a sort of consistent conversation with my spouse that's, you know, about something other than pain um, or, or that it's impacting, you know, a, 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 a thing that they used to like to do. And so they're, they're, they're feeling a little bit more isolated and cut off from, from those social things. Um, psychologically, we understand that folks also come in with a lot of depression, anxiety, understandably. Sometimes there's, 
anger about why this has happened to them, about why they're experiencing these things. So all of this to say chronic pain is this, uh, I think, huge presence in people's lives that impacts several domains, not just the physical. And I just wanted to throw this up here too. Um, I thought this was a pretty cool representation. Um, a, a little bit of a glimpse is into kind of um, pain psychology specifically, that we know that behaviors, emotions, and thoughts all impact chronic pain and that chronic pain impacts each of these things separately. Um, so we do see a lot of things like avoidance of physical activity. That's a very common one. Folks are afraid to do things that they think will uh, either increase pain or um, introduce new types of pain. Um, we also understand that folks um, can experience, again, as I mentioned earlier, depression, anger, anxiety in relation to their pain or in that, uh, in that kind of journey to fi find out what's causing their pain, that certainly all of these things can uh, manifest. And similarly, thoughts, we do see a lot of folks kind of uh, even shift towards, you know, blaming themselves, feeling, you know, less than they, you know, than, than they think that, that, that they used to be. Maybe they're feeling a little bit less self-worth. Uh, maybe they think, you know, their life is not as meaningful now that they have this chronic pain condition. And so these are all things that we certainly know uh, play a, an important role in the experience of chronic pain, no, not necessarily cause the pain directly, but um, definitely uh, impact the experience of it. And I wanted to also just share here, there's a lot going on on this slide, I will admit, but what I wanted to just focus on briefly is that we know that there are several factors that impact chronic pain and that these are kind of big bubbles or big sort of boxes where these things can be put in. So we know that there's physical factors that can impact pain. Something like, you know, how, how tense are we? Um, usually muscle tension uh, when we're stressed, for example, tends to uh, probably not help, in fact, kind of worsens chronic pain. Um, and that we know that we can uh, try to introduce a bit more sort of relaxation to try to help, um, I think, balance that a little bit more. And certainly, um, you know, medical providers and uh, some of the experts on chronic pain are probably the best sources to ask specific questions about what these physical uh, or medical interventions can look like. Um, but from a psychology standpoint, again, I am a little bit biased since that is my, my scope of work here, but we also know that certain types of thoughts can impact pain. Um, and oftentimes these thoughts can take the flavor of kind of focusing on the pain, worrying about the pain, trying to read about the pain, and oftentimes feeling more um, anxious as we'll talk about with emotions. And that often our job is to try to introduce maybe a more balanced way to think about this pain. And I think I just kind of gave myself away a little bit with emotions, but I just wanted to make a brief mention that certainly negative type of emotions um, can negatively impact pain and that we can try to combat those using um, not necessarily, you know, uh, change the emotions themselves directly because that's kind of hard to do. What we try to do is um, really approach the thoughts behind the emotions. How do we change those? Um, and certainly, you know, introducing relaxation techniques can also help with uh, emotions such as stress, worry, and anxiety. And similarly with behaviors, we want to, again, take a balanced approach, you know, don't try to um, shy away from physical activity, but also, you know, if we're doing it too much, that can also lead to more pain. And so we try to introduce kind of a balanced approach to even that. Um, we also try to think about, you know, introducing pleasant activities as a way to kind of not just boost mood in the moment, but really, you know, to kind of introduce that sense of, of I'm good at something and, 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 and I enjoy this, right? To combat kind of the negative um, feelings and thoughts that go along with chronic pain sometimes. And of course, social interactions, we try to get folks to um, build healthy relationships, have support um, and, and feel validated in their experience as well. So I think this is kind of one of the big uh, points I wanted to focus on in this presentation, and that is this notion that pain is in your brain, 
but it's not in your head, right? That, that notion that pain gets processed, right? Through the brain, through nerves, through the spinal cord, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's in your head. You know, I get that response a lot from, from patients, you know, they see the psychologist walk in and they're like, what are they trying to say now that I'm like, you know, making my pain up and no, that's not what we're saying at all. But what is important to note here is that pain signals travel from the nerves where, where they sort of originate or wherever they originate and up the spinal cord and into the brain. And in the process of doing that, they basically meet a bunch of chemical and I would argue electrical signals, um, more things than I can probably explain through here in, in a, in, and I think an elegant way. Um, but uh, those factors can influence the way that they travel up the brain, they can also influence the way they travel back down the brain once they're processed. And so a lot of those factors are actually the factors we just talked about. So even things like emotional stress, um, you know, are you feeling isolated? Uh, have you also just been sick, right? These are all things that we can consider as being some of these gates, right, that pain can travel through. We also think want to take time to explore a little bit what the brain does, right, with that pain signal once it gets there. And we do know that uh, pain gets processed through these thought centers that include, you know, the prefrontal cortex, which I like to call the CEO part of our brain, um, you know, that controls like the higher level thinking and it lets us kind of be a little bit more logical in our thought processes. And, and that also impacts this feeling center, which is really well, I think, illustrated here. I would also put in here, and I couldn't find a good picture of this, I would also put in here like a stress center because that certainly is another place where pain signals get processed. But in general, I think it's helpful to think about the brain processing pain through thought centers, feeling centers, and stress centers. And so I, I, I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, but I put a little sort of like old school police light over this brain because I like to think of, and, and this is what I tell folks in, in, in therapy is that chronic pain is kind of like a alarm, it's an alarm system. So short-term pain, for example, sets off that alarm and the alarm is helpful because it tells us, you know, maybe there's something short-term going on. Maybe you've stubbed your toe. And so the alarm is really telling you like, stop stubbing your toe, right? Like you are injuring yourself, but with chronic pain, that alarm just doesn't turn off for whatever reason, whether it's because there's ongoing, you know, stuff in the tissues where the pain is originating, or sometimes it's not, and it's not really understood clearly why that alarm doesn't turn off. Um, and there's a bunch of fancy names for that, that we don't need to get into here. But in general, we can think about chronic pain as sort of being this alarm system that doesn't turn off. And that alarm system can activate these thought centers, feeling centers, and they can also open up the gates for a lot of these pain signals. Again, I just wanted to make folks aware that we at Stanford um, Pain Management Center, we believe you and we know that your pain is real. So when we say pain is in the brain, please do not take that as a negative thing. Okay. So I just wanted to briefly share this as well. I think in general, I, I don't really wanna spend a whole lot of time on this slide. I think what I wanted to just point out is that oftentimes folks who have chronic pain tend to get caught up in this negative cycle, unfortunately, that worsens not only how they feel about their pain, but also just how they feel in general. And I, I what I like about this is that it kind of starts off by saying, yeah, you have some chronic pain, Maybe in this case, this person stops, you know, doing physical things. And because maybe that thing used to be very important to them, they start to feel some sort of negative way, right? Now they're not doing the thing that they used to love to do. And so now they're feeling bad. Maybe they've stopped, you know, hanging out with people. They feel like something in their life is missing. And so now they're in higher distress, right? And that distress can often serve as one of those gates that we just talked about for pain and oftentimes promotes the experience of pain and kind of begins the cycle again. So 
the other half of this presentation, as much as I can geek out about chronic pain, the other half of this presentation is very much about PTSD. And I thought it was important to take some time to explore what this is. Um, I don't know about y'all, but maybe it's because I'm in psychology and <laughs> I used to treat a lot of folks with PTSD, but I feel like this term kind of gets thrown around a lot in sort of common or, you know, uh, lay conversation. And um, I thought it was a good opportunity to kind of, you know, tell folks this is, this is, what, this is what it is. So PTSD is a post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what the acronym is for. And I think the most important thing to identify with PTSD is that there has to be this, it's like a, it is a requirement that there has to be exposure either directly or witnessing um, of some uh, threatened death or exposure to serious injury or sexual violence. So the only two exceptions to this rule are if, for example, you hear about it happening to a loved one. Say, you know, you, lo you learn that a particularly close person to you has undergone something really awful. That could definitely fulfill this um, requirement, if you will. Um, the other thing that we look out for is say your job, you know, cause or forces you really to kind of uh, be exposed to this sort of awful thing happening to people all the time. So for example, PTSD is a little bit more common among first responders. It can be a little bit more common among journalists, for example, who um, have to report straight from you know, active war zones, for example. But I think what I wanted to just really drive home is that you know, this, this, this first criterion is really just speaking to the exposure to um, threatened violence or threatened death or serious injury or sexual violence. This next part um, called intrusions is, is also an interesting one because oftentimes folks with PTSD come in and say, you know, I have, a, I have trouble, you know, staying asleep at night. I have a lot of nightmares that remind me of this really awful thing that happened to me. The nightmares can be an intrusive thought, right? It's uninvited and it usually speaks to the memory or some sort of encoded information that you have about the awful thing that happened to you. It can also take the form of an unwanted memory. Um, and oftentimes these can become so strong, right? That people feel like they're almost overwhelmed by that experience. And what that overwhelmed feeling can look like is, you know, you become emotionally distressed, most people also experience like a physical change, like either they get very, you know, as if they were reliving the awful thing, they were, they, they can become, uh, you know, like have palpitations, start breathing really heavily and really start, you know, feeling like they're reliving that. Um, sometimes we see folks who experience what we call flashbacks and these, I actually think they're a little bit less common than maybe folks um, uh, think, but essentially um, that's the experience of just losing touch with the reality. Like you're not even where you're standing. You're not even talking to the person you're talking to. And oftentimes if someone else is watching you, they'll describe that this person just looks like they like just spaced out. And it's because mentally they're reliving that. Um, and again, that's not as common, but it can feel like when you're having an intense memory, oftentimes people will tell me um, it feels almost as if I'm there, but that is different than having um, a flashback per se. This next uh, criterion called avoidance is also an interesting one. Um, I think a, a really important one to, to think about is uh, you know, avoiding places or situations or people even that may remind you of the awful thing that happened to you. Sometimes it could be just an avoidance of even having to think about the awful thing that happened to you. So even smells or, you know, uh, you know, people will avoid starting certain conversations or avoid places, uh, again, 
individuals all together that may remind them of those things. But I also wanted to take time to note that avoidance can also look like substance use, and that is very common. And I'll often ask folks, you know, if they tell me that they're using substances and I know that they have PTSD, I'll ask them, like, what does the substance do for you? And off, more often than not, they'll say, it helps me numb out. It helps me forget the awful things I'm talking, I'm, I'm living now. It helps me just kind of cope with the moment. And I mean, that that's, that's true, you know, like I'm not gonna argue that substances are not good at doing that. They're very good at helping us avoid in the short term and helping us kind of feel good in the short term. But in the long term, what we know is that the longer we avoid thinking about this trauma, right? This awful thing that happened to us, the longer we get to kind of simmer in sort of the thoughts and maybe some of the beliefs that we have around this. And that's actually my next point. Um, I think one of the less commonly known things about PTSD is that folks tend to experience a change in beliefs or sometimes a change in the way that they view themselves or other people or the world specifically um, in terms of safety. You know, oftentimes people will say, I feel less safe or I feel like I can't trust people. And that tells me, right, this is, you know, like, wow, this is, this is, this is pretty serious, right? So um, we often try to look at how those things have evolved since their exposure to this really awful thing. Um, I was going to say something else about that, but I think I'll come back to that, maybe hold it till the end. So that was cognitive and mood changes. Oh, this was the other thing. Um, with this, you can also see folks have what we call dissociative amnesia, or sometimes they'll, they'll forget um, parts of what happened to them. That is actually very common. I know that in the news, you know, in the last couple of years, it's like, you know, kind of as headlines when people all of a sudden remember, you know, um, specific traumas that have happened to them before. And all of a sudden they're coming out with it now. And there's like a lot of backlash and, but that can actually, I don't know if it can happen. Like, you know, I, I don't want to get into whether or not it can happen to that extent where all of a sudden you like remember all the things, but certainly we see folks who maybe remember um, only certain parts of their trauma and kind of have gaps in the story. And when we think about that, it's actually kind of protective, right, to not remember parts of these things because they were so damaging to you. Um, but it is also, I think, indicative of just how stressful that event was. And then lastly, um, arousal and reactivity. Oftentimes, because folks have undergone changes in mood, changes in thought and beliefs and feelings about themselves and other people, they will act out on those things. And it's not surprising. You know, sometimes um, it can be scary to be in a, you know, a situation where somebody with PTSD can be very quick to, to jump from, you know, being a little bit upset to, you know, um, becoming very outwardly violent. Um, that does happen. Um, I, the other thing I will say is that oftentimes this behavior can look like reckless behavior too. So sometimes people will feel like they have to act out in some way or feel like they have to punish themselves in some, in some way. And so it's not uncommon that we see folks who maybe overuse substances as like a way to um, kind of act out those feelings or maybe, you know, drive really recklessly on the freeway, et cetera lots of things. But I think the most classic thing to note about arousal and reactivity is that sense of hypervigilance, that sense of I'm not safe, and I'm going to keep my radars on for threats at all times. That I think is probably like the most classic, I think, example of this arousal and reactivity. And of course, we look out for these things having occurred for at least a month. Just thought I would show this really cute little illustration of what happens to folks with PTSD. Um, I really like the cannot concentrate. That's yes, that's, that does happen too. Okay, so similar to how we discussed with chronic pain, there are certainly um, brain areas that are impacted by PTSD as well. 
And one of them is also the prefrontal cortex or the thought center, I think is what the equivalent was in the chronic pain uh, illustration. And here, what this is just saying is that with folks with PTSD, this tends to become a little less active. And why that happens, we're not really sure. But what we do know is that for folks with trauma, because this trauma, it was such a stressful thing, similar to chronic pain, that stress signal never turns out. It never turns off, I'm sorry. And so it's like living in constant fear. It's like living in constant threat. And so what I didn't mention before is that oftentimes these emotional centers like the amygdala, like uh, and, and the and the prefrontal cortex oftentimes kind of play um, against each other a little bit. Not that they're you know in combat, <laughs> uh, in in when you're actually you know like when they're working. But um, what I mean is that they up kind of oppose each other. And so um, because these stress centers tend to get to turn up, they get turned up so much. Sometimes these thought centers like the prefrontal cortex get kind of turned down and vice versa. If we're able to boost our thought centers and kind of boost this prefrontal cortex, we can oftentimes balance this stress response a little bit more. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that our memories, right, and kind of how we encode information is oftentimes located in this area called the hippocampus. And we also know that when folks have PTSD, this too gets impacted. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's very apparent also when you're talking to somebody um, and, and they're, they're not able to remember. Again, keep in mind, these are protective measures, right? That your own body, your brain has taken to help you cope with, with trauma. So this whole talk was really supposed to be about one chronic pain meets PTSD and they meet very often. And that's really what I wanted to convey in this slide is that among chronic pain patients, you see a huge, huge, just disparity of PTSD. Like what I mean by that is when you, when you compare chronic pain populations to like a general sort of non-clinical population, we see a lot of PTSD in chronic pain folks. Um, we also know that among folks with PTSD, pain tends to be the most common physical symptom that people describe. And not surprising as we'll get into in a minute, but it, it's also possible, right, that folks develop chronic pain after PTSD as kind of this last bullet point points out. Um, it, chronic pain can become like a, a, a sort of a, a legacy, right, feature of someone's PTSD, especially if the PTSD involves some sort of physical trauma. So um, if, thank you all for hanging out so far. Um, if you have, if you have been kind of listening to this conversation, you may have noticed maybe some commonalities between chronic pain and PTSD, maybe some similarities even in the language. And if you pick that up, you are definitely right. Um, one of the big things that both chronic pain and PTSD share is this avoidance piece. And for folks with chronic pain, as we've mentioned, it's not uncommon for folks to stop doing physical things for fear of re-injuring or for fear of exacerbating existing, existing pain. And with PTSD, you know, the goal is kind of similar. Let me do stuff that doesn't have me remember or avoid remembering the things that have happened to me that are awful. So whether that be avoiding certain people, certain places, situations, that avoidance piece is definitely there. Also in this, together, I think negative thoughts and negative emotions are both hallmark features of chronic pain and PTSD. Again, for folks with chronic pain, oftentimes we see maybe, um, you know, kind of a more depressed feeling or emotion or state of being. Um, we also see folks feel a little bit less like themselves and maybe start to 
um, speak to not feeling um, important or valued now that they have chronic pain um, and feel a little bit less self-esteem. That can definitely happen. Um, so many variations of what those thoughts and emotions can look like. But for PTSD, similarly, right, now that this awful thing has happened to you, oftentimes folks with PTSD will start asking themselves, well, what does that mean about me? What does that mean about who I am? Why did this happen to me? Does that mean I'm a bad person because this bad thing happened to me? Um, we often discuss that with, you know, as fairy tailing yourself, basically, when we talk about PTSD, but that is a thing that folks kind of grapple with. And understandably, you know, after going through something so, so, so stressful and so horrible, um, you know, it, I think we struggle as people to make sense of why this has happened to me. The other thing I wanted to focus on is the sense of hypervigilance. Both chronic pain um, folks and PTSD are almost, uh, I would say, um, they share this hypervigilance experience. And for folks with chronic pain, oftentimes um, folks spend so much time just kind of scanning their bodies, right? Scanning for any new twinge. Does that mean that my existing pain is gonna be worse today? Oh, I feel a little less pain today. I think I can go to the grocery store. There's a lot of kind of monitoring. Also monitoring of things that may present um, increases potentially in pain. Or, may, or things that may worsen the pain. So even, you know, um, a sidewalk, for example, right? It looks so non-threatening if you just think about a sidewalk, but for somebody with chronic knee pain, that could mean danger, right? Like that, that's gonna make your knee crunch or it may make, you know, it may present a risk for fall, et cetera. Um, and for folks with PTSD, right? We're constantly monitoring to make sure we are safe, to make sure that there are no intruders, to make sure that there uh, are no possible threats to our safety and well-being. And so oftentimes, you know, I didn't mention this, but one of the things that sometimes impacts people with PTSD is even just like, uh, you know, looking over their shoulder, either literally or emotionally, figuratively, um, or even just spending time, you know, monitoring their homes, even physically, like locking windows, a lot of a time spent um, checking their surroundings, etc. And we also want to take time to focus on difficulty sleeping. So sometimes folks with chronic pain will, will say, I, I can't sleep well because of my pain. Um, and, you know, we'll spend a lot of time trying to improve, you know, how to get better sleep and talking about um, improving sleep in order to, you know, uh, better cope with pain because we also know that poor sleep um, tends to negatively impact pain as well. And similarly with folks with PTSD, I think it's important to note that folks with PTSD may also experience difficulty sleeping, but you can imagine if somebody's having nightmares related to their PTSD, they may wake up in the middle of the night and, you know, wake up screaming, which can really freak out, you know, like their bed partners or whoever they share their bed with, or they may end up flailing and hitting their bed partner. Um, and so that can often be a big topic of conversation is just sleep and what it's like to have nightmares associated with PTSD. And then lastly, um, I wanted to really drive home the distractibility and poor concentration that both folks with chronic pain and PTSD can suffer. Um, when we think about, again, both chronic pain and PTSD as these alarms that don't turn off, understandably, these take up a lot of brain space. And so it can be really hard to focus on one task at a time. And so it's not uncommon to you know, think about folks who even have difficulties reading or watching TV. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be a little bit complex when even somebody just says like, I can't even sit and watch my favorite TV show. Well, like what's going on with you? Are you able to focus on it? Is it because you're thinking about a lot of things? Is it because you're stressed out? And so it's important to just, um, I think, appreciate that difficulty that folks can, can experience and just kind of focusing on, on everyday things. So 
I wanted to spend a little bit of time here discussing, I think, what is increasingly becoming, I think, an area of, of focus. Some really, really brilliant people have taken a lot of time to start putting together basically theories for why PTSD and chronic pain tend to feed off of each other. And I've just kind of really taken the highlights from, from, what, I've, from what I've been reading. And what I wanted to share with you is really that you know, there is this attention to threat. That is a, a topic that comes up a lot. So we just talked about hypervigilance. That is certainly one thing that unites both PTSD and chronic pain. And the idea with that is that if we're already stressed out, if we're already having a high baseline level of stress, we're going to be looking for anything that may push us, you know, that may make our cup spill over a little bit. And so what that can look like is, as I've described, you know, avoiding physical uh, activity. If you have chronic pain, avoiding certain situations or people or things that remind you of your trauma, if you have PTSD. But what that also means, I think in the background is that you already live with a really high level of anxiety. Both of these things are hugely stressful. And so it's easy, easy to kind of have that anxiety spill over into this zone of catastrophizing which is where, you know, somebody from the outside may be looking at your thought process and saying, man, you just took that from zero to 100. You know, a twinge of pain for somebody with uh, chronic pain in the morning could mean the day is done, right? And that, that, that may sound like very exaggerated, but that is oftentimes the mental process that, that folks with chronic pain go through. And similarly, folks with PTSD can often go from I'm okay. And then all of a sudden, you know, run into somebody that maybe they shared um, that traumatic experience with, or may smell something or see something that reminds them of that experience. And all of a sudden, you know, they're hyperventilating, they're, you know, um, having a hard time, you know, getting themselves physically kind of regulated again. And so that is oftentimes one of, you know, the, the, the hallmark features, I think, that can I think feed into either exacerbating PTSD or chronic pain. When we think about catastrophizing, right, we're really, if we're thinking about that brain, those brain diagrams we've already talked about, we're really turning on that stress and emotional part of the brain again, which means we're really turning off that thought center. And so you can imagine that this kind of feeds, it's like, a, it's like a vicious cycle almost. We're already stressed out and now we're adding more stress to an already stressful situation. The other thing I wanted to mention is that pain itself, especially for folks who have PTSD as, that has some level or sense of physical trauma, that the pain itself can often be a trauma reminder. I worked with a lot of women veterans um, in my time at the VA. And those women for, I think most of them, if not all, unfortunately, have suffered some form of sexual trauma. And so for those women, oftentimes there was a lot of pelvic pain, there was a lot of back pain, and these pains themselves remind them of their traumatic experience. And it was really sad to actually talk about but I think it's important to note that the pain, that sometimes pain itself can also be a trigger, right? To appreciate that triggers play a, a huge role in maintaining PTSD and that pain itself can be a trauma reminder. I think I have beat avoidance to death, so I'm gonna skip over that. I also wanted to just share that, um, again, we see um, overlapping depression associated with both PTSD and chronic pain. We know that that can be an additional layer that certainly contributes to a lot of, I would say the negative thinking and the feeling like hope, like the situations are hopeless that they're going through. And that we can often see fatigue, just physical fatigue associated with that, but also mental fatigue. Um, and so it takes a lot, it takes a lot for folks to sit through therapy for that reason. So as a clinician, I have to constantly be sensitive to the fact that, you know, this person's already dealing with a lot, as we've mentioned with stress and stuff, but 
that we're also adding more challenges, right? Because, you know, doing therapy is challenging. It is going to be a mental workout. And if you're doing it right, you should feel a little bit of fatigue. So we want to be sensitive to the fact that um, both folks with PTSD and chronic pain can have this fatigue, which if you can remember back to factors that impact pain may also be a pain uh, gate opener, if you will. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip to the fact that I think similar to how we were discussing physical pain being a trigger to PTSD symptoms, I think it's important to also note that pain and injury itself, just from a social justice perspective, can also be an indicator that somebody feels like some injustice has been done to them. And we see that very often in, in the chronic pain management center here at Stanford, but also I think it's a thing that I've seen a lot in folks with PTSD. And, and that's a very, I think, uh, important conversation to have. And it's important, I think, to be open, you know, as a, as a, as, as a client or as a patient to your provider about, because I think it can really open doors to speaking to, I think, some really, really, I think, amazing conversations, difficult conversations, I will say, but really good conversations about, um, I think, the emotional and social tax, right, that pain, um, that pain can bring, but that can also speak to a lot of the injustice of sometimes um, folks who suffer from PTSD. So I wanted to just mention that. Okay, so uh, if folks have been following so far, we've talked about a lot, but these are the big takeaways. So I want, if anything, I think I would, I would love for folks to walk away from this talk knowing that pain and PTSD are both stress responses, specifically stress responses that were maybe evolutionarily designed to be helpful. We're not trying, you know, to sit here and say stress is bad, you know, that, um, that it doesn't do anything for you. No, evolutionarily, they were meant to keep us safe. But pain, chronic pain specifically and PTSD are both stress responses that don't turn off and don't necessarily give us more information or don't necessarily give our brains more information. We also want to um, have folks walk away with the fact that PTSD and chronic pain occur together a lot, like really a lot. Um, I cannot tell you, I think most of my PTSD patients at the VA had some form of chronic pain. Um, and so it, it, it is a thing that we see very, very much together. We also want to drive fact, the, home the fact that PTSD and chronic pain feed off of each other quite a bit, as we've just discussed with kind of some of the mechanisms potentially behind why. I think we're still trying to figure out all the reasons why, but we do have enough, I think, of an understanding to appreciate the fact that both PTSD and chronic pain do kind of tend to, to feed into each other, especially when we think about them being as stressors, right? We know stress doesn't help chronic pain. We know actually stress probably makes the experience um, worse. And we also know that when somebody is in pain and has PTSD, they might be reminded of their trauma all the time, or it might be an additional stressor that might flare up a trigger, for example. And these will be like the last two points I make. I want to also just keep us and, and you know, have us kind of keep in mind the different brain parts that we talked about, the different brain components that process stress, that process pain. I, I would love for folks to walk away with the fact that stress decreases, right? The higher level thinking. It's like as if stress turns down the volume of the CEO part of our brains. And alternatively, that, that, sounds, that sounds challenging, right? But what I think the good news is, is that if we can find ways to turn up that CEO part of our brain, we can, turn, we can actually find out ways to turn down that stress response. And actually a lot of the coping skills that we use in therapy are 
designed to kind of do that, to bring back creativity, to bring back logical reasoning, to um, basically just turn down um, that stress response a little bit. So some general recommendations. I just wanted to end with this. Again, please, please, please check in with your medical or mental health provider for specific treatment plans that fit your needs and your goals. But these are just kind of general things that I wanted to share with folks. So some of the psychology pieces, right? I'm just talking about psychology pieces here. Um, some of the psychology things that we think could help with some of these unhelpful beliefs are things like CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain. And what that often looks like is finding out, you know, what are some of these thoughts? What are some of these responses that you have around pain? Not necessarily after pain happens, but even just around pain. And is there another helpful way we can look at those things that might better serve you? We also can consider for folks with PTSD, um, that there are therapies called, for example, cognitive processing therapy, where that is really like the meat and potatoes of that therapy. Um, it's, it's, I used to do that type of therapy at the VA. Um, we do not offer it here, unfortunately, at the Stanford Pain Management Center, but we'd be more than happy to refer you to a community provider. But this um, CPT type therapy really focuses on restructuring some of these existing beliefs and looking at how these beliefs have evolved since the time of trauma. And can we, again, look at these from different perspectives enough to kind of slightly alter them to better serve you? And also, I want to say that the ultimate goal is to make you feel better, right? Because we can't necessarily change your emotions, but we can certainly change the thoughts that drive those emotions. Again, in decreasing a stress response and the absence of danger, again, we're not here, you know, we're not, this isn't a, a campaign against stress and all stress being bad. Stress is an emotional uh, response to danger, right? And it's an evolutionarily helpful one. So we don't want to squash that response. But in the absence of danger, right? So for example, for somebody with chronic pain who has really no, um, you know, they've been discussing with their provider and there is really no ongoing organic thing going on that's worsening their pain, we want to try to help you manage that stress because we know that alarm is still going off. We just don't know why. Um, so I, I wanted to just mention um, and in, in, in terms of decreasing that stress response, especially to physical activity, we would do you know, something like time-based pacing, um, making sure that you get enough exercise to still be challenging to you, but also not overdo it so that you feel like you can't even get out of bed the next day. We wanna try to find that, that smooth medium that lets you still kind of challenge yourself, but, but be able to um, kind of keep going throughout the week and to avoid kind of the, the big ups and downs, if you will, of activity and potentially emotion that goes along with that. And similar um, to that, we I, I wanted to just briefly mention prolonged exposure or PE for folks with PTSD. This is a therapy that um, essentially has folks who have specific um, tasks that maybe they need to do or get back to. Um, and slowly reintroduce those things back. So for example, um, somebody who has had a motor vehicle accident and has a really hard time getting in a car, but they have a really far away job that you know they need the car to get to, we would certainly want to get that person back to, to work, right? And so we would work on that slowly. And you might hear of something called interoceptive exposure techniques. Um, we don't necessarily, again, use that here at Stanford Pain Management, but um, if folks were interested, um, th these are techniques that many psychologists use to basically tamper down stress responses, specifically for folks who have panic attacks. Um, and so oftentimes we'll try to kind of rewire the way brain, the brain kind of thinks about some of these physical responses. Um, Lastly, I just wanted to mention mindfulness as a huge, huge practice that we definitely talk about with most folks as a way to exercise that CEO part of the brain. Mindfulness, if we think about it, 
It's a three part thing. We're being intentional about it. We're paying attention to the here and now and we're being non judgmental about it. That is a very hard thing to do when we think about it. There are people who spend their entire lives right um, focusing on this. And so we do try to introduce that if that's not already present. Um, as a way to, to bring about some decrease in distress and maybe look at things from a different perspective, non-judgmentally, et cetera. Um, and we do know that that helps um, for both PTSD and chronic pain. And of course, being holistic providers, we do not want to ignore the fact that nutrition has a role here, sleep, important, hugely important, um, as well as social support. So one last thing here, I just wanted to make folks aware of the PTSD and chronic pain page that is directly from the VA. Um, this is a really good, I think, um, resource. It's free. You can just kind of check this out. Um, but it kind of gives you a sense, right, that these two things go together a lot. And um, it's, a, it's a nice little resource to just kind of check out overall recommendations and um, some of the information we've covered here is certainly on that. And lastly, um, meditation, I, I, I don't think, um, you know, this hurts anybody if you want to give this a try. Uh, UCLA has some pretty nifty ones that are free and available in several different languages.